Okay, so this is a presentation just for the upper cauldron of the system of three cauldrons. Simplistically, the upper cauldron is the head, of course. <clears throat> now, I've chosen to do it at this time because we're coming up to the spring equinox, which is actually tomorrow. And the traditional starting point of the spring equinox is when the sun goes into the sign of Aries, Aries the ram. And in traditional zodiac law, the three fire signs correspond with the three cauldrons. And it's Aries that governs the head. So Aries, spring equinox, head, upper cauldron, ram's horns, that's where we're at at the moment, symbolically. Um, Leo governs the heart. So the middle cauldron in the year makes more sense with the time of Leo going into Virgo. So in kind of like late August, roughly Lunasa is the middle cauldron. And that's when we look at the middle cauldron because it makes much more sense with the star law that corresponds with Broom. And she's the grail maiden because her time of the year is the heavenly chalice and, and the cauldron of that. And the lower cauldron fire sign that we've already done is Sagittarius. That's the thighs generating the heat of the lower cauldron. Or in Qigong Tai Chi, the thighs stimulate the chi production by stimulating the kidney channel in the legs and storing it in the lower bowl and stuff. So anyway, the upper cauldron then is defined by the star law of Aries, the fire sign. And the first diagram for that is this. So this is the sun cross and the wheel is just the year. And at the top here is spring equinox. So it's a day of equal day and night. And here is winter solstice. Okay, so we've gone from winter solstice round to spring equinox. And then we come to summer solstice and then autumn equinox back to winter solstice. So that's called the sun cross. It's also known as the four stations of the sun, but it divides the year into four exact moments, the solstices and the equinoxes. Now, in many old temples, the solstices are represented as two pillars that hold up the temple and the aisle through the temple is the equinox line you know that that's the way into the temple or the holy of holies if you like but so simplistically we're going to keep coming back to this kind of natural division of the upper cauldron because it's aries spring equinox into two halves a dark half and a light half and it's also the year so there's a dark half of the year six months and six months are the lighter half of the year. So from spring equinox onwards, the days are longer than the nights for six whole months until autumn equinox. And then it's the time of the winter king and the, day, the days get shorter and shorter and the nights are longer in the middle of winter and so on. So it's a simple kind of division of the year into a light half of the year and a dark half of the year. Now there's many ways that can be played out. And I'm gonna keep things simple first, but one of the first divisions is often this thing, where the two halves can be seen as day and night. So there's summer and winter months, but also day and night. So it, and, and so that happens every 24 hours rather than every 12 months, if you like, you know? And what you have with this is you have the sunshine on one half of the, mind, uh, brain, upper cauldron, and the moon shine on the other half of the brain, upper cauldron. Now, simplistically, um, the sun is just pure radiant light. And, it, and mentally, we can just say that's pure knowing. It just shines with knowingness. It perceives all things. It doesn't have to think. It just is. And the moon is reflected sunlight. 
And that reflectedness is really important because that's the mind that thinks, it's the mind that contemplates, it's the mind that muses and ponders over things. So half of your mind has the power of pure knowing perception and the other half of your mind thinks and contemplates and we're both we're, we're, and we're meant to work both together at the same time they're not at odds with each other um but we're going to go into some stranger territory in a minute where we go like this and i'll come back to that but what i want to draw your attention to is between day and night there's this dividing line and i don't know if you can read it on screen i've written um, dawn and dusk, okay? So between day and night, there's this liminal half-light or twilight between the reflective mind and the knowing mind. There's a, a, a middle space, okay? And we're gonna look at that. Between yin and yang, there's a, a liminal space, okay? Now, <clears throat> turning it this way, What you then have is nighttime, the realm of sleep, and daytime, the realm of being awake. Okay? And with the dawn and dusk, there's being awake and falling asleep, and there's being asleep and waking up. And those two different thresholds of that liminal space between them are different types of dreams, different types of dreaming states. One's called hypnogogic, one's called hypnopompic, and they're different types of dreams. And if you're doing shamanic things or meditations for visions, you're actually playing with conscious awake to conscious asleep and that liminal space. Or you're perceiving visions as you come back from meditation, back to waking up kind of thing. They're two different, dawn and dusk are different things, okay? So... Before I go, in, go any further with that, the mind itself, um, I nearly called this uh, upper cauldron talk psychism, as in psychic abilities, uh, psychism, dreams, and visions. Um, but that's with a healthy mind. Uh, equally, the flip side of that is the upper cauldron can be the realm of stress, worry, and anxiety, you know? Uh, so the, the older, like we were talking a minute ago about old Irish and modern Irish, the old wisdom doesn't have the advantage of modern science and medicine. So we can listen to what was described in the past, but then relate it to how we now understand body functions and hormones in the body and the way light and dark affect our retinas and change our cortisol levels and melatonin levels. So that, that there's so much more to it. So the older writings tend to be more simplistic. For instance, the old writing from Ireland about the three cauldrons, which is 14th century, talks about for most people, the upper cauldron being down for most people. And the bards were trying to turn it upwards so that they could receive divine poetry and inspired speech. And, and you could say a uh, connection with spirit and get the radiant brow of Taliesin, that kind of idea, you know? So they're using these poetic metaphors. And it's the same in China with, uh, Taoist ideas of Qigong, but they have what they call the three Dantians, which are the same as the three cauldrons, okay? So the upper Dantian, they often describe as having the potential of Shen, which in English is S-H-E-N, Shen. And again, it's something lost in translation. So it's often just said spirit, Shen is spirit. Um, but spirit means different things as well. So what they really mean, as far as I can tell, is that if the upper Dantien is full of vitality, the lights are on, the eyes are shining, there's a charisma 
shining through of a happy person full of vitality and that's showing their spirit you know and if they're ill or broken emotionally the lights are turned off that there is there is no spirit in the eyes you know what I'm trying to get at is by Shen spirit, they do not mean your eternal soul, <clears throat> you know? So even the most broken, depressed, unhappy person is still an eternal soul. They're just not shining with any spirit, you know? So it's not, shed, it's not spirit as your eternal self, you know? You're an eternal being anyway, whether the lights are on or not, sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> So with that idea then, I'll show you the mind. So I'll give you some insights into how the upper cauldron can work with psychism, dreams and visions shortly, but equally um, a troubled mind. The, the mind can manifest stuff, you know, it, it can project ideas onto things and people it can create there's a fascinating thing in the occult world called mirroring where you can actually create synchronicities you know for instance if you focus on something for a fortnight like really think about a certain topic for a whole fortnight you'll start getting tons of synchronicities it's almost like the outer world is mirroring your mind you know, and if you don't keep your feet on the ground, you can take it as confirmation of every mad idea you've got and you'll think you're on the, the thing, you know, but it, it's actually a, it's some amazing super mind mirroring thing. But also I mean, we're all familiar with ideas of manifestation. You can manifest goodness and badness in, in, in your life as well. So the mind is a real double edged sword in that way. So. When I go on in a while to talk about upper cauldron ideas, it is depending upon, and there's degrees of sanity, of course, but it's depending upon the wholesome well being of the individual, you know? So, equally, someone who is stressed and worried and full of anxiety through no fault of their own, but they can manifest their own terrors and fears, you know? And, and, and so, where did I write? I wrote something down there. Uh, say you're having a shamanic journey then, or a vision quest. I wrote down, the journey that you experience begins with your state of mind. That we're thinking about, you know, where are you at at this moment in time? Are you stressed and worried and frightened? That's going to dictate what kind of vision you get. If you're peaceful and calm and fairly grounded, you're going to get a different type of vision, you know? So it's like quantum physics, the person viewing the experiment affects the ex experiment, you know? And so your visions that you get or your dreams when you're asleep are dictated by the, the well-being of your fears and anxiety levels and your peace and calm tranquility levels is obvious isn't it really but it it shows you what a kind of um poor oh, mind field mind field that the brain really is so how do you fix that how do, how do you balance that well it's the simple medicines then are um and you don't even have to know yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong, just slow quality, deep breathing is gonna do amazing things for you. If, you. if you made it a five minute routine every day or, and then built up to 10 minutes and you just practice slowing your breath down and by default that will calm you down and take you out of fight or flight mode and, and take you out of fear and just make you peaceful. I, what, I, what I do, most of the time is I spend about 10 minutes before going to sleep, just slowing my breath down so that I'm in a more peaceful place before my head hits the pillow, rather than letting my head hit the pillow when I'm worried about this, that, and the other, you know, just kind of change it. And we're going to some of those brain waves in a minute. Um, so the two things to fix a troubled mind are slow breathing 
number one. And then number two, wherever you can find it, a really healthy, wise philosophy of life. You know, that's it. Be a philosopher, make sense of things. So slow breathing, philo philosophy, those things help you balance your brain. No, I didn't say religion, just philosophy. Wise words, you know. Now, um, the upper cauldron then in English gets translated as the cauldron of knowledge. I said before in a previous clip, I, I wouldn't use the word knowledge. And, and the reason for that is that even the most, the, the idea of the cauldron of knowledge is to turn it upwards and get inspiration, get inspired thoughts and divine poetry and, and, and song and stuff. Now, knowledge is a different thing. Knowledge isn't very high at all. So even the most uninspired and depressed, fed up, miserable mentality can learn information and remember it. You know, that's knowledge, that, that isn't inspiration. That's just the ability to take on information, remember it. But there's no inspiration there, so it, but it is knowledge. You know, so that's why I, I steer away from cauldron of knowledge. Um, I prefer the Greek word for esoteric knowledge, which is gnosis, you know, gnosis or knowledge of the higher self or the spirit stuff. So divine knowledge rather than mundane remembering stuff knowledge. It's not that kind of knowledge. Now, <clears throat> before I move on from that then, um, Breathing slowly and trying your best to not be fearful and frightened and, and worried. And, and I'm a hypocrite because I still worry, you know, but it's about trying not to and, and, and at least before bedtime, calm yourself down. And it's so important because each cauldron affects the well being of the other cauldrons. And a troubled mind over many years will destroy the body. You know, digestive system shuts down, internal ulcers, even cancer, you know, can all be traced back, a lot of it, to, a, to maybe four decades, five decades of worry and anxiety, you know. On the other hand, a balanced mind, a peaceful mind, will help the body heal, you know. And so that's why yoga, qigong and tai chi, uh, uh, walking in the countryside and breathing slowly, anything that just takes you out of fear and brings you to peace and tranquility is gonna help your body start healing and fixing itself. And that's all driven by the upper cauldron, of course. So. <clears throat> threshold consciousness. Now, what is that? The, the threshold consciousness is this, the threshold is this dividing line or this veil or hedge, we'll say that deliberately, between two parts of the mind, okay, between the sleeping mind and the waking mind or the thinking mind and the knowing mind, this dividing line, we could call it twilight. So between night and day, there's twilight. Okay, between the sun and the moon, there's twilight. And, and this space in between neither one nor the other is, is the magic place. And that's where the dreams and the visions come from, whether it's dreams from falling asleep or visions from meditation like drumming and, and so on. It's all to do with that space between night and day or winter and summer, sun and moon. <clears throat> now, um, in the modern day, in, in modern science, they have understood that there's at least five different types of brain waves that are going on uh, with the body, 
and with the head when it's meditating or, or just being in general. And um, they're quite interesting, especially in the sense that with the Welsh Celtic otherworld stuff, the word used for the other world is anuin or anun, okay? And the best description I've heard of it, explanation I've heard of it was from a modern translation of Mabinogian. And the author, I don't know how to pronounce her name, it's like Shoned, Sean, Sean Shoned Davies, her name. But she explained how it's actually made of two words. And the first element is A-N, just an. And then you could put a line and the second bit is nun. You know, so it's like an nun. So, and what that means literally in her modern translation is inner world. So anuin translates as inner world. Rather than other world or underworld, inner world. And there's a nice idea that, um, you know, talked about how the outer world can mirror your mind and give you synchronicities of whatever you're contemplating or working on, that somehow the outer world is a mirror to what we're doing or thinking or being. Um, so the implication is that it's mirroring everything that's coming out from inside of us, you know? So your spirit world isn't heavenly, heavenly, heavenly far away. The spirit world's inside and the outer world manifests or mirrors towards you. So when that gives a different meaning to Anun as inner world, you know, that these, the, the beings and the entities and the gods and goddesses of Anun are not outside, they're inside you, you know, and that's where the connection's made inside you, in your middle cauldron more than likely, but the lower cauldron, and upper cauldron are all part or one mechanism anyway, really. So anyway, going back to the brain waves then. So they, they use the uh, Greek alphabet. So there's two brain waves for normal everyday activity, if you like. And because of the Greek alphabet, they're called alpha and beta. So there's alpha waves and beta waves. They're the first two types of modern understanding of neurolo neurology of, of the brain. So the, uh, the beta wave is when you're concentrating on something. You might be homework or, or really thinking about something, you know, you're chunking away, turning the wheels around, focused on something, that's beta wave activity. And alpha wave activity is more relaxed. It's just chilled out, sunbathing, having a cup of tea. So it's not, it's, the wheels aren't churning, but you're wide awake, you know? So you're wide awake, but relaxed, that's your alpha waves. And then when you start doing your homework or studying something, you're into beta waves and the brain's churning. So they're the two normal everyday things. Um, then there's an extreme mental place called uh, gamma waves. And gamma waves are, fairly rare, but that is close to the upper cauldron being the radiant brow. And it's because gamma wave activity is those light bulb moments. It's when you go eureka about something, it's just burst into your head, this gamma wave activity and you've perceived something, you know? So that's quite interesting. And then the other two waves are slower than relaxed so you've got thinking about things beta waves you've got chilled out sunbathing alpha waves and then below the relaxed alpha waves you've got theta waves and that's our most interesting one because theta waves is where we get visions and dreams and, and that's where you go when you're meditating and drumming and, and dreaming and daydreaming and stuff so you're beyond relaxed, you're actually half asleep and the visions are coming in, you know? So that's theta waves. And lowest of all is delta. And delta is when you're so fast asleep, you're not even dreaming, you know? Delta waves are when your brain is silent and that's the most 
restorative of your body. That's when your body's healing itself. So you're not even dreaming. Your body is just fixing bones, fixing tendons and all the rest of it. So that's the deep sleep. You know? So um, I found that quite interesting then. So that of the, that there was some, with the theta wave mentality, the dreaming, they referred to it as internal focus. And I thought internal focus was a really interesting description when Anun is the inner world, you know, this kind of internal inward focus um, or daydreaming, the vision questing and stuff. Now then. <clears throat> If you're wide awake and it's daytime and you're just doing your normal stuff, that's your alpha and beta waves. And then at dusk, you go to bed and you put your head on the pillow and you start to fall asleep, but you're not quite asleep and you're starting to see visions and, and dreams or some people just see spirals and patterns or even hear clairaudient voices or whatever. Everyone gets different things, but you're in that place that's not quite asleep but not awake anymore you're drifting off then you're into your theta waves and then you fall asleep and then after your sleep you start to wake up and and, and you're back in that liminal space of dreamings and visions but the brain uses falling asleep one way and waking up another way so they're both a twilight zone between day and night but they do different activities. And here's a thing, um, apparently everybody dreams four times a night, whether they remember it or not. Unless your dream is, unless your sleep is really interrupted by drugs or, or alcohol or illness or something, you know, but a, a normal average everyday person that's reasonably healthy is gonna dream four times a night, whether they remember it or not. But, but here's how the threshold stuff works. So the falling asleep is called hypnogogic. And that's often the dreams that are just garbage. You know, they're like a jumbled load of nonsense, really. And, and the theory is that's just your brain defragmenting the day's activity and then churning it all around or what have you. Know? So that tends to be the falling asleep stuff. Or going into the inner world stuff. It's just kind of, I've just been in the outer world and now there's all this going back in the inner world thing. Uh, so the waking up bit is the interesting one though. So from being asleep to waking up, they call hypnopompic. And it's in that field, in, in that twilight zone between asleep and awake, when you get premonition dreams, prophetic dreams, inspiration for the day ahead, like a second an extra sense of what's about to happen, or you can even get guidance from clairaudience and stuff on the pillow. And so that's from being asleep to waking up. So they're two different things. So like the end of the day, falling asleep, just defragmenting, garble, garble, gobbledygook. And then after the long deep sleep, there's help coming into your next day. You know, there's guidance coming or, or insights and stuff. It's really interesting. So, they know that reasonably scientifically from studying the brain and sleep deprivation uh, and brainwave activities and so on. And it's an insight that the ancient Irish didn't have and the ancient Chinese didn't have. It's our modern world science and electricity allows us to measure those things and stuff. But um, so even when you don't go to sleep, say you're just drumming and you're, you're gonna do a vision quest for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. So you're not gonna go to sleep, but you are going into theta wave space or you're not gonna get a vision. You have to, you have to go there. You have to put your toe in the water to get the vision. So that means coming out of alpha wave, chilled out, relaxed to almost falling asleep. And it's in that almost falling asleep 
and you might fall asleep, you know, you're that close to it, that you'll start to have your vision quest or, or get insights. And often for a lot of people, actually, when the 10 minutes are up, that's when they get something. And it's that, that coming back kind of thing that they're getting things. So it's interesting how those brain functions work. And, and, and also interesting, so like for dreaming and vision questing, it's the theta waves when you're almost asleep. However, there is that unique gamma wave, eureka light bulb moment, and that's different. That isn't to do with falling asleep. That's something else. I don't know what the pineal gland is picking something up from where there's a the word idea someone says oh come up with a good idea or get an idea and it's actually from is it greek i think where it's the i the self and dear is the goddess of inspiration and so it's not so much you know if i say to you go go away and get a good idea come back when you've got a good idea you can't you can't manifest an idea you receive it you know so it's like, oh, oh, there, I got, I got it, I got it, you know. And you were either tuning in or not tuning in. So, it's, so that that kind of gamma wave reception of or upper bowl receiving divine poetry is potentially a different thing to having a vision quest. So the vision quest is like going into the dream world and, and almost going into the lower cauldron, into the deep dark endlessness of the lower cauldron and, and getting whatever comes up. But then the gamma wave is a different process of just eureka, instant, ping, there it is in your head, you know, different things. Now, um, Franklin used a phrase the other day and I can't remember what it was, but it, but it was, it kind of implied that the outer world was some sort of uh, manifestation of the inner world, that the inner world creates the outer world. It was something along those lines. So I just want to talk about something from classical Greek uh, mythology, and I'm going to really simplify it because it's a long story, but I'm going to make it very simple. But it is about certain insights that the ancient world had, uh, and this story is called the cave of the nymphs. And it's just a story metaphor to help students grasp a concept. You know, that's, that's a lot of bardic things should be stretching people's gray matter to help them take on board some esoteric idea that's then gonna germinate in their brain and, and stuff. It's not just a story telling thing. So this thing of the cave, the, the cave of the nymphs, is this, that, and it's quite gruesome. There's these people in a cave and they're chained to the floor by their ankles and they're chained to the ceiling by their neck. So they can't turn around because of the chains and they can't walk away because of the chains on their ankles and their arms are out and they're chained. So they just can't move. They're stuck there and they're looking at the cave wall. And behind them is the cave entrance. And the light of the cave entrance is on the cave wall. So all these people know of reality are shadows moving on the cave wall. So there's stuff going on behind them, but all they can see is the stuff on the cave wall, okay? Now here's the explanation is that the cave is your skull. You are in your cave, you're, you know, that all you can see is what you see with your eyes and that's the cave wall. You know, it, everything around you, the mirrorings, the synchronicities, the manifestation of life is shadows cast by the inner world on the cave wall that you perceive with your eyes. So that's old Greek stuff. Now we don't know what the Druids taught, but these ideas were fairly universal. You know, the Druids used the Greek language for trade. 
trading in goods. And if you're trading in goods, you're having campfires and you're sharing philosophies and ideas and all those sort of things, you know. And so even and another one is a Roman, and there's a famous uh, epic called the Aeneid written by Virgil. And in, in the Aeneid, um, the hero Aeneas goes down into the underworld to see the ghost of his father. So he actually goes in, goes past the three-headed dog and goes to speak to the ghost of his father. And eventually he gets there. So he, he's going from the waking world to the Hades or the world of wherever. And he seizes the spirit of his father who had died. And his father then explains to him, his son, the nature of the world. And whilst his dad's explaining, there's other people arriving that have just died. So they've arrived in the other world and there's souls waiting to be born as well. So Aeneas is seeing spirits before they have been incarnated kind of thing. And anyway, to, to really simplify it, after watching the arrival and going of spirits, his father says to Aeneas that the whole world is just mind. Yeah. So you've got, you've got the Greeks with the cave of the nymphs and that what we perceive as reality is actually just the cave wall of the light of the spirit world. And you've got the Romans saying it's all just mind. You know, and nowadays, uh, quantum physics and everything are, are drifting off in that kind of direction as well, you know. So the upper cauldron, God, what do you say about it then? So it's all those things, you know, it, it, it is a peaceful place of tranquility and clear seeing and psychic abilities and perceptions of reality beyond so-called normal reality gnosis cauldron of gnosis cauldron of knowing the spirit of things but it's also the place of fear and worry and anxiety and terrors and nightmares and, and all that stuff you know and if you don't have wholesome sleep patterns you're going to have a troubled mind uh, and the first thing to do is to find yourself a wholesome sleep pattern and then you can start to work with the inner world anun, and and the visions that will then turn it up but i'm still i'm still unsure about that because the inner vision seems to be about relating to falling asleep and getting to the vision place whereas the gamma wave the instant eureka the radiant brow might be a different process i don't know i'm still learning anyway that's my bit you can turn your mic microphone's back on it's still recording this conversation for youtube That was fantastic, Gary. I don't remember the word that I spoke, but I think I could um, amplify what you're saying. And pardon me if I'm repeating myself, but we can think of interiority, not just as the personal interiority, but the interiority of cosmos, which comes out of the black hole, which is the yin essence. Everything's... Uh, the photons before they've collided to create something. The yin is, uh, is the black hole spelled W-H-O-L-E. And when something emerges out of that, it's because of vibration, which is literally, I, we can think of each photon, which is the smallest thing that has energy in the universe. And if it goes at the speed of light, it has the weight of the universe, <laughs> so it's very paradoxical. Uh, and each one of those we can think of as a little serpent doing yoga poses, and the yoga poses are making letters. And so at that most fundamental field of the cosmos, there is intelligence creating the vibrations that are forming the waves that are becoming the holographic experience we're seeing and hearing and experiencing. <laughs> and it's Yin, the great mother, that gives rise to cosmos, the Yang principle. It just reminded me of a Taoist diagram, 
where it is a diagram of the three cauldrons or the three dantians, and it's three circles. It's just one circle above another circle above another. And the lower circle is just black. So that's yin, you know? And so that would be the lower cauldron is the mother of all things, you know, yin. And the upper cauldron is white, it's just yang. So that might be the eureka power sort of thing. And actually the middle cauldron is the yin and yang symbol of the black and white fish. You know, that's where they, they come together in the middle dantian, if you like, you know, the heart mind sort of thing. But that might be why, so then the anuin or the inner world, the going into the dreaming, that's like descending into the yin dreaming realm. But that might be different to the burst of yang that gives you a eureka moment. I don't know. The middle earth, the middle cauldron, which is the heart, the, the whole nature of coming to the world is this heart experience. Uh, when this is what I've written about, this is what the article will be, and and it's that when we're reborn, that experience of birth leaves a trauma, the original separation. If we get baby talk making special, and we get fairy tales, happy endings that are programming the the growing mind, the growing soul, uh, then the original separation trauma of birth uh, can can you know be ameliorated it's not it's not a big problem but if we don't get the baby talk and we don't get the fairy tales with happy endings the frontal lobes um, develop before the emotional brain so the bridges between problem solving and emotional coherence like loving, your parents and loving your siblings and then loving your neighbors, um, we, we get the narcissistic wound. So highly clever, highly bright individual, but with a, a shadow that is fragile, prone to lies and alibis and betrayal. So fairy tales and, and, and those good stories you were talking about, like a good philosophy, that creates the bridges for emotional coherence between this incredible um, brain that can imagine the universe, even the whole cosmic universe, right? We can imagine that. Uh, but we need to have the bridges into the ancient emotional uh, watery world, right? Branwen starts with King Lear has been imprisoned the ocean of emotion is imprisoned. Father is missing from the family. There's an emotional wound. Five siblings of Panardin have, have grown up without their dad. And there's uh, one of them, you know, is really like a narcissist, if nice, and he's, he's having these, these, you know, wild traumatic eruptions of emotion. And uh, so there's a real psychological um, layer to the story. And the, the queen of fairy, Mob Inogian, Mob, the queen of fairy is, is this divine feminine presence with the voice telling the fairy tale, shining on the brow of the child, the shining brow receiving love and, and growing security so that as an adult, they can pass that on to the next generation. Brilliant. I read somewhere that um, thinking of the upper bowl and apparently it, it's not until you're 40 years old that the synapses fix into wherever they're going to fix. So up until up until you're 40, they're quite plastic and all a little bit all over the place. And of course, a uh, misspent youth. And you know, I drank way too much alcohol in my 20s, but you know. Other people do drugs and other things, but that interferes with it, you know, but it isn't until you're 40 that things just boom, like there. So the mind hasn't become what it's going to become until you're 40. It's mad. But, and so for 40 years, the upper cauldron, <laughs> it's, just, it's like Alice in Wonderland, eat me, drink me, it's just whatever is going to affect that, you know. We have a mundane experience with this mundane world, but the, the 
it's connected to the other world. The other world is you know, upper world and underworld, but Middle Earth is both mundane and the other world, the interiority and this exteriority. That's yeah. happening in the middle. The middle bowl is the meeting place of the two. Yeah. And so it's complicated. Yeah. I, I, I was quite surprised actually, because I was, I think my hierarchical way of thinking made me think that uh, the, the upper cauldron was going to be the kind of like commander or the, uh, the, I don't know, where a lot of that talk about, I don't know, I guess you know, I was expecting a kind of ruling position really uh, for the upper cauldron. So I was quite surprised in the talk that it wasn't really like that actually. I'll tell you how I see it. And I think, um, I think our energetical body, our energy body, very different to our skeleton and flesh and bone body, you know? So the, the three cauldrons, if you've got the upper, the lower and the middle and you draw a circle around them, then the middle cauldron is the nucleus of the atom, if you like, energy wise. And I, I see the upper cauldron almost as a periscope of, of the middle cauldron, you know? So on a very simple level, before we're male and female, and male and female is hormonal, testosterone and estrogen and stuff. Before we're that, we're spinal cords and pineal glands. And really, it's the middle cauldron expanding up and down. And the reason I say that is because the Chinese don't rate the brain very highly. That They call the um, brain the sea of matter, you know, but they rate the pineal gland. So you've got the pineal gland and then it's protected by all this sea of matter. And I think the, the logic for that in some ways is that your brain, like your bones and your skin are perishable, you know, but your eternal self, your heart, mind, your middle bowl is eternal. So I was saying, so I was saying about the upper bowl being spirit and shiny eyes, uh, but it might be broken because you've been raped and abused and your family members have been bombed and all the rest of it. So there's no light shining, but you're still an eternal soul. You know, that's kind of how I see it. But people can differ, of course. But the idea that the upper cauldron receives the Eureka enlightenment from Yang or from somewhere as well, you know, that the pineal gland goes ping and, and gets, gets whatever it gets. I have a question or sort of a thought that, you know, we, you, I, I believe I remember you saying that when people were uh, uh, candidates for studying Druidry, it was a 20 year experience. Um, so if you started really truly studying i mean there's like pre-studying like mimicking and caring and apprenticing but then then there's studying so if you start studying at 18 19 20 by the time you're 40 your mind has come together so that all of this um uh connectivity is is fruitful i don't i can't put the right words to it but do you know what i'm saying yeah, <laughs> yeah no definitely you know that was a gamma wave experience <laughs> <laughs> as the light bulb moment yeah yeah well, one of the great revelations comes from robert Bly in iron john when he points to somebody's research suggesting instinct was stored outside, not like animals born ready to do things. We need that two years of incredible narcissistic nurturing, uh, emotional security and diaper training um, uh, and all that in order to survive. And instincts are stored out there. So this incredible, the trait is that we get plasticity so that the humans can create everything and anything we can imagine. You know, we can go out into space, we can go down into the sea, all these incredible inventions. Uh, but the, the plasticity, 
we put the instincts outside and that's the fairy tales and the mythology. They contain the instincts that we're not born with. And if we study them, they, they have images that are archetypes and archetypes are like, they're, they're musical, they're visual, they're um, part of uh, colors and orchestrations. Archetypes are just these incredibly interchangeable um, organ of seven vibrations or a scale of seven reaching to the next octave. You know, the primary archetypes of the planets, <clears throat> these are universal, you know, humans are expressing them, but, but they're not unique to humans. They are cosmic archetypes, not unlike numbers, right? To uh, enter the field of philosophy, you study geometry, it gave you a sense of what does it mean to be an eternal thing, right? Because numbers will always come up with the same answers for eternity. And then you can take the step to understand these archetypes are eternal cosmic principles. Well, that goes back to like a lot of cultures, they start with sound, you know, like in the beginning was the word and, you know, the word was the creative force or the ohm is the sound of the world. And um, yeah, I could see like if you're associating the different cauldrons with different times of the year, like the upper cauldron of Aries, um, you might use a tone. Um, you know, the later the alchemists were looking at the music of the spheres because they only knew the seven planets. And that's why we have seven uh, musical, in our musical scale. And, um, a lot of cultures are pentatonic, aren't they, as well? And, and the twelve is uh, John Michel differentiates the ancient nomadic seven note scale from the civilization's twelve note scale, and and that goes from like wild people to civilized agricultural people. It's a big Left change. Left brain to right brain. Yeah, and and from heaven and earth to water and fire. Yeah, there's this transition into the civilized state we're in. But it's not always so civilized. You know, there's like we lose that connection, that intuition to the gods, and it becomes a symbolic, like it goes unconscious. This world that we were in touch with goes unconscious into a deep ocean that we that we need, you know, the sirens call us down there to go deep and understand what's going on down there, because it's it's still there, but we're not conscious of it. So you're talking about Mab and she's telling the fairy tales and it's like she's weaving the you know the weird you know word it's it's the it's like a spell when with you make with your voice so yeah exactly exactly yes and, and a, a good storyteller say like in the evening around a campfire or something they're going to bring everyone slightly down from relaxation into a theta wave hypnoticness almost so hypnotists use the theta wave because then they can put positive suggestions into the individual so a storyteller a bard would start talking slowly and getting into people and, and putting seeds into people's psyche that are going to grow and things all clever stuff and poetry and music are going to help with that hypnosis, aren't they? You know, that, that, that's the power of the bard, definitely. They, they help people make bridges to the other world. The nine muses, you know, it's like the archetypes go through the nine, the nine muses all are dealing with the, the scale, you know, this incredible archetypal power. So back to the trees then. Um, we're still in ash at the moment, and tomorrow is the, there's a funny noise there, tomorrow is um, spring equinox, so tomorrow is actually the salmon's leap, you know, tomorrow is going from Pisces into Aries, and it's making that salmon's leap back to the beginning of a new zodiac thing, so that's happening tomorrow, and then we're in Aries for nine days so feedback so, so then for the next nine days after the equinox it's aries which is the upper cauldron 
But then we're into the days of Hawthorne and Hawthorne, the May Queen, uh, is completely Aries. She's not Pisces at all. She's just completely Aries. So the upper, the upper cauldron is going to correspond with Hawthorne more than any other tree. Funny noises there. Yeah, so that's interesting. I don't know what that would mean, of course, but um, in my mind, Hawthorne is all, all to do with the Mab story of um, of Kiluk Wan Owen. Uh, Owen is the daughter of Hawthorne, and she's the May Queen, and she's the heart's desire of the young Lou, uh, who then employs King Arthur and his entire retinue to achieve a whole load of impossible tasks. And at least five or six of those impossible tasks are star law, definitely, you know? And I, I would suspect if I had more knowledge that, that there would be more star law. I would suspect it's a bit like the 12 labors of Hercules and that it, these are impossible stories around the stars. Certainly at least five or six of them definitely are like the three birds of Rhiannon and, and stuff or, or getting Gwyn at Neef Orion the hunter helped to help, you know. So then also the salmon's leap then with the, the where's that thing? Um, so say from the dark half of the year to the light half of the year, back to the beginning then. So we've been at winter solstice and spring has gone into in bulk. And then we've got to spring equinox, and that's just where we are right now. So then ash will take us into the beginning of the light half of the year, but then it's Hawthorne, the May Queen, and she very much dictates the whole Beltane thing between oak and holly and hazel to apple and stuff. So that Aries, the head stuff, is like waking up then, isn't it? It's been asleep. The year is on the threshold of waking up at the spring equinox and that's when you get the premonitions and the, the guidance and all the rest of it so that's where the year is at right now and um hawthorne is like getting out of bed putting your clothes on <laughs> you know? and in, into the summer half of the daytime you know and the, i love all that rites of spring may day beltane stuff and you know, so nice so the that light and dark, that yin and yang duality, it's the cycle of the year, it's the two halves of the brain, it's a, awake and asleep, it's in breath and out breath. Yeah. I have a qu another question, if you don't mind, Yori. Um, you know, with the, the Qigong um, stuff, you know, we talked about the lower cauldron, it's very much about like, you know, that was doing like the wuji posture you know you're, you're building up your chi in the lower cauldron but um you know on a on, on that level of, of qigong what what's going on with the upper cauldron with in terms yeah if, if you understand what i mean so the, so there's different ideas about that and so what i say next isn't any dogma it's just the way i perceive it um yeah. the other andy here is a tai chi brother of mine and he's very experienced, uh, knowledgeable. Uh, Andy taught, uh, teaches Tai Chi and other martial arts in Barnsley. Yeah. Yep. And he has done for more years than I have. Too many. <laughs> 79 or <laughs> so. Yeah. Andy's about, got about 20 years on me, I think, nearly. Um, so so uh, Different things then, I think for beginners, and I don't mean this to be patronizing, but I think for beginners, it's very difficult to do Zhang Zhong and stand still and be silent. It's very, very difficult. So because it's difficult, visualizations are used, you know, a small orbit of chi, energy coming up, energy going down, or, or a ball of chi or whatever, but they help focus the mind and the intent and chi goes where the intent goes sort of things so that's all important 
But I think what you're aiming for ideally is 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of no chatter whatsoever. You know, no visualizations, just breathing in, breathing out and silence. The, and that's the holy grail. I wouldn't say I can do it very often. I, I, my mind goes all over the place. I come back to just watching the in-breath, the out-breath, or thinking about my weight distribution between one leg and the other, you know. But I think the highest level is just silence. You know, just turn it off for 10 minutes. It is the highest level. Uh, it's not easy to do. So visualizations are that, you know. What would you say, Andy? Uh all that that you've just said but uh my my way as well as that is standing and knowing where you are <laughs> being, being in that space and being very much aware your feet are and then taking your feet down into the earth and um just knowing where you are being comfortable where you are and then carrying on doing what you've been saying there you know uh it's I don't. I missed the last one. I don't know what you said about the other one uh, or the qigong, but breathing down and standing in one space and being aware of where you are, in my opinion, has to come up first before the breathing, and before everything. You know, in the Welsh, where they have a, a saying, "Bother uh, come an hour," is be here now. So you have to be where you are. And if you're not aware of where you are, the other things won't work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another, so being silent and thinking nothing, it needn't be as difficult as that. What's really nice to do, very similar to what Andy just said, if you're outside, close your eyes and just listen. Yeah. Listen to the birds, listen yeah. to the traffic going by, you know. Yeah. So you're not thinking about all your problems, you're just listening. No. Just listen. Just be there. Yeah. Mm. Because you're in the the, the Dalai Lama did a talk two nights ago, and he gave the uh, the, um, the greatest speech of the Buddhist philosophy that came from Avalokiteshvara when Buddha went into a meditation and 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 this this great divine, really high deity, gave us a talk uh, through the Buddha, and and the gist of it is all form is emptiness, the nature of emptiness is form. This is really incredibly helpful, and it's what you're talking about. That that it, it, you know, whatever's arising in our senses or in our thoughts, if we recognize and remember, this is empty. This has neither good nor bad, nor here nor there. The true nature of it is emptiness. It's like an instant, an instant uh, eureka. You know, it's instant release. It's absolutely a sword that cuts directly through all of the minds samsara and and all of the chitta all of the activity that is the nature of the mind this teaching whew, right to the essence emptiness is the essential nature of everything here and so you yeah. can just enter that emptiness yeah wuji wuji yeah. mental wuji yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But another way of looking at it is like with Tai Chi uh, fighting or, or pushing hands is if you're touching your wrist against somebody else's wrist or body and you're trying to feel their body weight move or you're trying to feel what movement they're about to do to you. You're trying to read the, read the chess play by um, subtle movements. Now, if you've got noise in your own body, if you've got tension in your own muscles, you can only hear or feel your own tension. So you have to be empty and relaxed and silent to move with every little thing that they do. And, and I think Andy would agree that if you have a preconceived idea that I'm going to do this technique, the other person already knows. No. Tinging, know, listening, yeah. tinging. List, yeah, tingin, listening power. Yeah. Listening power. Mm. But it's listening with your touch rather than your ears. Mm. Yeah. And, and feeling. So the, the greatest, I think, the greatest skill achieved by Tai Chi is empathy. 
that, that you're, you're feeling what the other person is thinking of doing or whatever, you know, that it's just... It's the ultimate sensuality, isn't it? Yeah, empathy. Mm. Yeah. So that would agree with Franklin, and, and to, that is emptiness. It's, 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 it's nothingness, isn't it? That just tingling. So it's that receiving kind of thing, the upper cauldron, you're in a receiving space where you're open to what's going on around you. Paradoxical, isn't it? So yeah, it's, it's, it's ready to receive. Like at, like at the other Andy said, it's being here and now, it's very aware and attentive, but it's not, it's not thinking, it, it's just being. Yeah. Just had a the exterior, oh, go ahead, go ahead, man. Like coming to what that was called, what I would refer to as Satan's cave, that um, analogy, like with people being trained in the cave. Yes. And the, um, the, uh, not seeing the light behind them, what you see in shadows. So what might actually us, what actually might chain us to the cave is actually our own mind. So once we turn yeah. the mind off, we can actually turn around and see what's behind us. Yes. Yeah. To know what's behind us, we want to study myths and fairy tales. Because what is actually alive in eternity are archetypes. Just like numbers will never cease to be numbers. Even if we recreated the universe 12 times, number would be the same. Number is eternal. And these archetypes are eternal principles. And they are encoded into the myths. They are encoded into the fairy tales. They provide the, the, the moral, the eternal morality that in our modern world, we pretend that it's all just capricious and, and, and you, know, you can just make up the rules as you go. That's not right. <laughs> that's, that's the fallacy of modernity. In fact, the morals are eternal. They're archetypal and they're encoded and we can find them by, you know, in, in the simplest of fairy tales and in the most complex of mythologies. It's an archetypal language. It is our interiority, but it's not just our interiority. It's the interiority of all of life. Animals have moral intelligence. So then the other thing then is how, you know, the three cauldrons or three Dantians, they're all interconnected. So the well-being of the upper cauldron depends upon the well-being of the middle and the lower, you know. So for Tai Chi, that begins with posture and relaxation with the, the lower Dantian and the lower cauldron and stuff, you know. But then also finding your be here now, peace and content in the middle cauldron is probably, probably the most difficult of all, really. But in Irish, it translates in English as the cauldron of vocation. And, and vocation is, what are you here for? What, what is your purpose? You know, why did you incarnate? Because if you're not doing what your vocation is, you're never, ever, ever going to be content or happy. And, and if you're not in your vocation and you're not happy in your heart, mind, this ain't going to be happy. You know, so the well-being of this peace of mind is dependent upon the contentment of the middle bowl. And it, it, your vocation is your soul tapping at the door saying, you know, <laughs> are you there yet? Are you doing what you came here to do? Are you in the right place? You know, hard, hard stuff. A, a, a lot of people don't even know what their vocation is. You know, so they, you know, we've all done it. You seek happiness in temporary things like a sex or alcohol or, or something, but it's not a permanent contentment, you know, only by being true to you and living the life you, that you should live, are you going to find that contentment, you know? So until you do, this won't be peaceful. It can't be. It's always going to be things, things aren't right. You know, things just aren't right in my life, you know. Uh, Holy grail again stuff, isn't it? But it's an example of how 
the well-being of each cauldron is interdependent with the other two. You know, so bad digestion in your lower cauldron is going to affect your mentality. A urine infection is going to affect your mentality. You know, so they're all interconnected, and and too much too much anxiety is going to screw up your digestive system. So they all affect each other at the same time. Things like qigong, tai chi, yoga, walking in the park, breathing slowly, those things will balance it all out. You know, it's just slowing yourself down to be balanced, isn't it, really? Easier said than done. Life has its soap operas, you know, <laughs> easier said than done. But that's how it works, isn't it? So that the basic comprehension of the three cauldrons is how they all interconnect, you know. And I think with the upper cauldron, we're interested in visions and second sight or receiving inspired poetry or, or whatever, you know. So these talks are about understanding the mechanism of it all. And it's ongoing. This whole care for our cauldron, it's not like you come to a place where you've got them all up and you're rare, raring and ready to go, you know? I mean, I, I, that's what I'm, I'm experiencing in this journey where I'm way far back here, but it's what I want. And it's about being present in the moment and um, consciously uh, being aware of the breath being aware of where my feet are and then to see what's around me to go in and then to go out it's like breathing in the inner sanctum and breathing out into this infinite space or i tell my students breathing in the mercy breathing out the grace and as a as an exercise that's constant or does it just i don't know maybe not maybe there are people like the dalai lama that are stuck there <laughs> lucky him but i already said you know, he, he said you know we're, we're enlightenment is being right here in reality like it, 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 it there's nothing more than than just the present you know that's that's enlightenment is right there exactly where you are and and he said, you know, we, 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 you, you can't like get shakti pot, you know, you're gonna touch somebody and suddenly have an instant enlightenment. You might have a moment uh, of the cauldron, but it's it's the it's the life's work and many lifetimes of work of uh, you know what's called merit and merit is the heart of bodhicitta, like Yuri, you were saying, you know, uh, we're and 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 as you're saying, man. Um, Hong Lin practice, you breathe in as much difficulty as you can handle. It might just be your own little difficulty or somebody you love's difficulty or the whole world's difficulty and you're willing to breathe it in and exhale the medicine. You breathe in as much as you can handle of this, this pain of the world that you're willing to sacrifice your time to transform into medicine. And this Tung Lin practice is merit. And with enough merit, then your body relaxes. You're no longer carrying the tension. It, it, it completely relaxes out. And, and then you're just present. And then you're just silent. And then you're enlightened. You know, it's not like, you're not, you know, you're not in heaven exactly. You're just present. <laughs> you're not, your mind isn't every which way you're concerned about other things. Let's go. <laughs> What a fun talk. We're at the end time. Any, anyone want to say anything before we go? Thank you. No. All right then, happy, happy spring equinox. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah. Thank you, Yuri. Keep well. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.